Good evening and welcome to this World Affairs Council Europe Day. We are really, really pleased to have you all here to uh, celebrate Europe Day with us, which is actually, of course, tomorrow. But uh, uh, in light of the, uh, the speaker we had, to, had tonight and he was able to come tonight, we rearranged Europe Day to say that it's actually tonight. We'll start celebrating a little bit early. It must be, it must be the new day somewhere. Uh, but welcome, and we're proud to uh, have you here. And Mr. Mr. Ambassador, we, we welcome you especially, but we'll do that more formally uh, later. Uh, we, uh, due to uh, Ambassador Eisenstadt's very tight schedule, uh, I invite you to please begin your salad. This is not usual for us, and I know you'll be relieved about this, actually. Uh, Mark Becker is not here, but if he were here and Dennis Lockhart, they'd be saying, finally, he got the message after all these years. So please uh, enjoy your salad while I say a few remarks and ask some others to do the same. Um, first of all, uh, I want to recognize a, 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 some people who are uh, friends to our council, uh, leaders in Atlanta, and, and important for what we're trying to uh, accomplish here. Uh, first, uh, the, the um, uh, Vice President for Academic Affairs, the Senior Vice President of Academic Affairs and Provost uh, Lisa Palm from Georgia State University. Uh, we're, <laughs> as you know, we, ha we, we are located at Georgia State University. While having a citywide mandate, of course, uh, we, we have had great support and strong support from Georgia State University at all levels, and we're very grateful to uh, Risa and, 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 and the President Becker and all of the uh, senior people at Georgia State, and of course, Dean Fenwick Huss, uh, one of our board members. Uh, also uh, introduced now and a little bit later, but uh, to recognize David Abney, the, the COO of UPS, uh, and our chairman of the World Affairs Council, David Abney. They, 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 you hear of people flying into meetings, it's sort of a phrase. Well, they literally flew in just a few minutes ago from, from a meeting, uh, and so we're glad they made it and are here safely, and it's great to ha have uh, David, of course, in leadership with us. And now the real challenge for, for recognizing, uh, and if I get this right, I probably won't, but I'm going to do really hard, Antonio de Lethea. And, and uh, that's, I th did I get... I, I am so pleased. Uh, this, is, this is great. A great lesson. He's the minister and special advisor to the head of delegation of the European Union Commission in Washington and represents the European Union in that special way here. And since the European Union is also, uh, 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 we're operating this dinner and this celebration under a grant from the European Union, we're especially uh, 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 proud to have you here, minister, and, and we're grateful for your long service uh, to the cause of European and American uh, uh, relations uh, and north, uh, northwestern relations. We're grateful, and I had to skip that little, put that little northwestern uh, and the North American uh, phrase in there, North American phrase, because uh, I want to recognize uh, the uh, dean of the consular corps, a member of the uh, board uh, of the World Affairs Council, and Ge Consul General of Canada, Steve Brereton. <laughs> We are gr very grateful that the Dean of the Consul Corps is a member of the board and has been since, uh, since we started the World Affairs Council and the successive deans have uh, agreed to be part of our board and it's been a great partnership. Of course, this event is a partnership with the, w with the Consular Corps and we're grateful to all of you who represent many countries uh, from Europe and beyond uh, who are here tonight representing uh, uh, your countries and of course the interest of what we're talking about here here tonight. Uh, and so we do thank uh, our, our sponsors uh, all, uh, all along from the very start, UPS, the Coca-Cola Company, and many others that you see list listed. The people who uh, bought the tables, there are many people here who organized to get uh, uh, people here tonight who need to hear and want to hear uh, the message from the ambassador and to ce celebrate Europe Day as well. Uh, we thank uh, not only the European Union for the grant that made this event possible, uh, but also the Halla Foundation, uh, and we're very grateful for the support of that wonderful uh, foundation based here in Atlanta that is so deeply engaged in German and European interests, and we're grateful for their uh, support. Uh, and of course, finally, uh, thanks to, to uh, Cedric Sussman, 
who really, really, this time, I say it every time, and it, this time it is beyond true. Uh, Cedric is the one, the inspiration for this, and his uh, friendship with the ambassador allowed us to organize all this in a way that I hope is meaningful for everybody. So, Cedric, thank you, a spe special thank you for this event. <laughs> and, of course, we always m mention, and this is, I think, the only time I have ever seen her actually in the room when I say this line, and she's even talking, so she won't hear me. Don't leave, Ina. You know, because I want to recognize our own force of nature who actually makes the mechanics of everything work, Mish Spink. So thank you. She, she's never in the room. It's a miracle that she's here. It's wonderful. Uh, so they, we've worked 12 months to make this possible since the last uh, event that we did with Consular Corps, so we're really proud to have, it, have this here. I have a, another two... Uh, folks who just want to give a word of welcome, first, uh, uh, Consul uh, Vasilios uh, Galusis, who, who is the uh, Consul of, of, of Greece here in Atlanta. But in this context, he is also Mr. President to me uh, because he represents uh, the Greek presidency in the European Union. He will uh, say a few words of welcome. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. I can think of no more opportune moment to have such a distinguished speaker as Ambassador Eisenstadt, as this one. I didn't think I was about to talk to you because we have a representative of the EU Commission here, uh, but it seems it's my destiny. Um, we had so many high-profile visits in Atlanta within the last few months that are demonstrative of the interest that the EU has in this area. Ambassador de Almeida, Minister de Lesea, the Deputy Chief of Mission, who's be, going to be coming within the next few weeks. But now you're stuck with me. As a European and a Greek, I did not have a hard time making friends in the United States. I really appreciate what my American friends taught me. I leave the States within a few weeks, being a little bit wiser through talking to them all the time. I appreciate their practical outlook on life. They told me, for instance, that everything is like a plumbing system. We do care for it when something goes wrong. That applies to both the economy and allow me to say that to the US-EU relationship. Because it was not, although the, this relationship did never break down, it was not until recently, that is the latest developments in Eastern Europe, that my interlocutors my, actually my American interlocutors turned the spotlight on Europe, on its meaning for the whole world. My friends also told me that perceptions are stronger than realities. And this is true. I think that indeed, even if we are the biggest and strongest economists in the world, even if we can create the biggest free market in the world through concluding the TTIP and creating more jobs and more prosperity. It still would not matter if we think there's nothing into it. Because things tend to have the importance that we attach to them. My friends, last but not least, told me that our bonds, European American bonds are strong because we share the same values. Well, dear friends, values is a very trendy word, but it's a kind of a vague concept. I told them that a set of values is something that everybody can claim to have nowadays. I tend to focus more on principles. It's through formulating a principled approach to things a principled foreign policy, a common foreign policy that will earn 
both the United States and United Europe more respect vis-a-vis -vis others. And what I mean by that is that human rights violations are the same and sh they should be called by their name, whether they happen in the North, South, East and West. That respect for territorial integrity of countries is the same and it should be respected and cherished in North, South, East and West. In the Ukraine, North Korea, in Cyprus. My friends also told me that we are strong together because we understand each other. Being aware of our differences, I told them that we need to do more on that. We need to engage in a dialogue that is constant, an open dialogue. We should ask each other and talk to each other rather than spy on each other. We should respect each other's special interests. We should respect each other's uniqueness and systems as we stand united and show solidarity to each other. As we celebrate Europe's Day today, I can tell you that after five very challenging years for myself, my country and the European Union, I guess the most important thing my friends told me is what they did not tell me. That is, that what I was telling them should apply equally both into US-EU relations and into intra-EU relations. Then we can all claim that united we stand as the free world, as the West, and the future that awaits us will be bright and prosperous for everybody. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, introduce uh, Claire Angel, our wonderful friend and, and uh, director of the Office of International Affairs uh, for, for the city of Atlanta, representing the mayor. Good evening. It's my great pleasure to be with all of you tonight. Atlanta is honored to have been the home of the World Affairs Council of, of Atlanta since 2010, and I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to Wayne Lord and Cedric Sussman to make this event happen. On behalf of Atlanta Mayor Kasim Reed, I would like to welcome home the Honorable Stuart Eisenstein, former U.S. Ambassador to the European Union, among many prestigious titles. As a European myself, and on the eve of the EU's anniversary, also known as Europe Day, I very much look forward to what you have to say on the state of the European Union. Today, the European Union face, faces many challenges, from economic downturns to security threat with the troubling situation in Ukraine. However, the EU remains an incredible success story, and, the, and an economic as well as a geopolitical powerhouse. The European Union also represents Georgia and therefore Atlanta's most important partner, especially in the economic realm. As a prime example, Europe generates about 60% of the foreign direct investment in our region, responsible for the creation of thousands and thousands of local jobs. And it is my hope and those of many holders that agreements such as TTIP will bring this relationship even closer. Again, thank to the World Affairs Council of Atlanta for putting this event together and for having me tonight. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Please enjoy your dinner, and uh, Ambassador Eisenstadt will be with you in a few minutes. Thanks.
Ladies and gentlemen, I hate to interrupt the uh, conversation and the visiting at each of the tables, but because of the schedule and because I know that Ambassador Eisenstadt has some really important, I think, messages to bring to us tonight, we'd like to start the program uh, immediately while you're eating uh, because we want to move along and also leave time for questions. So I'm going to call on the Chairman of the Council, David Abney, uh, Chief Operating Officer of UPS, to introduce our guest. Thanks, David. I'd like to welcome everyone here. and. Uh, I had two jobs tonight. I have completed one of them, and that was to get the ambassador here on time. So we flew together. We landed a little early. I'm thinking things are great. And then we hit the intersection of 85 and 400, and it slowed down real quick. But it did bring me a little comfort to know that since I had the main speaker, that you couldn't start without us, right? So, so I thought we'd be OK. And also, I get to introduce uh, uh, Ambassador Eisenstadt. And uh, my great pleasure, I can't think of a better speaker to have here than uh, for this event than to have the ambassador. Uh, I consider him a friend. I've known him for nine years or so. And I'll refer to him as uh, Stu. And, uh, you know, he is an Atlanta native, grew up in uh, Morningside, went to high school at Grady High School. And, uh, and more importantly, is the father of two sons and the grandfather of seven with number eight just around the corner. I am also a grandfather, so we had a lot to talk about on the way over here. And uh, the ambassador got his uh, bachelor's degree at the University of North Carolina, which he was telling me tomorrow he's going to celebrate and attend his 50th reunion. And of course, got his uh, law degree at Harvard, and uh, and the ambassador certainly committed much of his life to public service, and uh, he has been involved in four U.S. presidential administrations, starting with President Johnson, and of course President Carter, President Clinton, and now President Obama. I'll just highlight a few of his uh, accomplishments. There were so many that. Uh, just had to take a few, but under President Carter, he was the chief domestic policy advisor. Also was the first U.S. ambassador to the EU, which of course makes him the absolute best speaker for tonight's uh, program. Uh, led the U.S. delegation on the Kyoto Protocol and uh, also special representative of the president and secretary of state on Holocaust era issues for the Clinton and the Obama administration. And in fact, the AJC quoted uh, the ambassador saying that this is one of the things he's most proud of in his life. Also found out today that he's recently joined uh, Secretary Hagel's Defense Policy Board. So how he finds time to do all these things, I do not know, but he does, and, uh, and the country's certainly better for it. So today he serves as senior counsel for a Washington law firm, Covington and uh, Burley, and has been a member of the UPS Board of Directors since 2005. So with that being said, I'd like to warm round of applause for uh, Ambassador Eisenstein. Thank you very much, please. <clears throat> the great uh, Southern author Thomas Wolfe wrote a famous book called You Can't Go Home Again, but in fact, you can. And every time I'm back in Atlanta, I, I feel at home. Uh, I did go to Morningside Grammar School and Grady High School, and the thing that I was hoping that Dave would say in my background, because it's my real claim to fame, was that I was All-City and Honorable Mention All-American Basketball Player in my senior year, <laughs> but with a giant asterisk, pre-integration. Uh, it is really a special privilege to be here because I am in Atlanta, 
It's a special privilege to be here because I'm speaking to the World Affairs Council, and this is uh, my third speech since uh, Wayne Lord's been president, and to be with Wayne and, and Cedric Sussman, my dear friend, is, is also very special. It's special to be here because it's Europe Day, and it is Europe Day. It's uh, 1 o'clock in the morning in uh, Brussels, so it is officially Europe Day. Uh, and to have uh, the council generals and honorary councils and Alba uh, my very good friend, Ambassador Almeida's representative, Antonio de Laca, here. It's also very special to have Dave Abney introduce me. Be Dave is a leader of the World Affairs Council, but also the chief operating officer of UPS, which is, I think, the best managed company in the world. And Dave and I have uh, had a very dear relationship now for for almost a decade. It's also special because I, I learned only at the reception that uh, Deidre Berger uh, has come in from Berlin uh, from the American Jewish Committee, and I'm on the uh, AJC's German Advisory Board, uh, and the head of uh, her, the southeastern region is here as well. So there are just multiple reasons why this is so special. Europe Day is recognizing the creation by Robert Schumann, the great French diplomat, of his concept after World War II of a new European construct. I don't think it is possible for the visionaries like Schumann and Jean Monnet Paul Henri Spock, Mr. Spinelli, and Hal Stum, to imagine their vision of what started as a small European coal and steel community with six countries initially in the European economic community after the Treaty of Rome in 1957 would now blossom into a union with 28 member states and 500 million people. And I draw inspiration, I have to tell you, from my time in Europe, but I also draw inspiration because one of the reasons I'm interrupting your dinner, and I hope I'll give you food for thought to substitute for it, is because uh, having just landed, I'm just going uh, to my reunion in Chapel Hill, and I'm very pleased that the former dean of uh, Arts and Sciences, Rita Palm, and now the Provost of Georgia State is here as well. So this makes the evening complete. But what has happened with the European Union is absolutely unique. There is no other institution in world history in which sovereign member states have come together, not in a UN-type organization, not in a G7 or G20, but in which they have pooled whole areas of their sovereignty and giving it, given it to a central institution while still maintaining other areas of sovereignty. And as the EU started, it has reformed the 1992 Maastricht Treaty, the 1997 Amsterdam Treaty, the 2001 Nice Treaty, and as I'll talk about at more length later, the creation in the Lisbon Treaty of 2009 of the Common Foreign and Security Policy. What are the accomplishments on Europe Day that we can look at and admire and be inspired by? The first is that it is literally the first institution which created a peaceful Europe. Between 1870 and 1945, there were three major wars involving substantial parts of the European continent. Since the creation of the European Union and its predecessors, there have been no wars between its member states, now 28. And indeed, not only have there been no wars, but almost all the members of the European Union are also members of NATO. 
and under Article 5 of NATO have pledged each other to common defense, of which we, the United States, are a part, if any one is attacked. So far from being a threat to each other, they now are bound together by a defense pact. But interestingly, it's not just in NATO. The European Union has its own mutual defense pact, in which the EU members, now again 28, are pledged to come to the common defense and to use all means necessary if any of their member states are attacked. The second great achievement on Europe Day for the European Union is it is the first time in which Western and Eastern Europe have been united under a series of democratic free market principles. The only other times there was even the semblance of unity is when there was a Napoleon or some military leader who forcefully brought countries together. Here, free countries have come together from the East and the West. And what is remarkable, and my ambassadorship was just after this, is that after the collapse of communism, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the end of the Cold War, within the short period of two decades, all the major East Bloc countries, all the countries that were under the thumb of the Soviet Union, all the countries that for decades lived without democracy, without free speech, without tolerance, without human rights, under communist dictatorships, because of the incentive to join the EU with its free market, democratic, tolerance, human rights principles, were able much more rapidly than would ever have been possible to embed themselves in those very principles. It's really remarkable. Two decades, if you think about it, 1990, here we are in the first decade, beginning of the second decade of the 20, 21st century, and we've now got 28 member states many of whom lived under communism, now embodying the very principles which Monet and Spock and the other founding fathers created. Quite amazing. And the attraction of EU membership, as I'll talk about in more detail, with the EU association agreements, even for countries that are not yet members, like Ukraine, was one of the sparks for the Ukrainian problems. And when the promise and hope of membership fades, as it has for Turkey, unfortunately, Turkey has the longest standing application for EU membership. And when the promise or hope of EU membership faded, then the reforms, the democratic reforms that Turkey made have themselves begun to evaporate. And we see very troubling signs in Turkey now, in part because they've lost hope for membership. The third thing to celebrate on this Europe Day is the creation of a remarkable set of enduring and durable institutions based in Brussels. One with which I interacted as Ambassador to you most frequently, but not exclusively, was the European Commission. And think in our terms that the Commission is the equivalent of our U.S. executive branch. It proposes legislation, it proposes ideas, it conducts trade relations and negotiations, in which I engaged with then Sir Leon Britton, who was a trade commissioner. It has the power to bind 
the member states on key issues like, like trade. If any of you in the legal field or in the business field has had any merger involving a European and American co company, you know that it also has the commission, through the competition commissioner, the sole jurisdiction to pass on mergers and acquisitions. This is a real functioning executive body. A second institution which has developed particularly since I came, and I would say frankly that I was one of the first ambassadors from the U.S. that paid any attention to it, but it's matured markedly since I've left, is the European Parliament. This is the elected body that represents the citizens, the people of Europe. And they will be voting in just a few weeks in the new parliamentary elections, electing in their countries MEPs, members of the European Parliament, who will represent them as citizens of Europe as well as of their country. And they form political blocks like the Socialist Bloc, the People's Party Bloc, just like we have the Democratic and Republican parties, although perhaps more functional in Brussels. But it's a real parliament with appropriation authority, with legislative authority. And the third major institution is the European Council, which represents the 28 member states, has its own president, Van Rompuy, and roughly it's the equivalent of our U.S. Senate because it also has to approve legislation, first approved by the parliament in order for a law to come into effect. The next institution which is worth celebrating started only in 1986 with the Single European Act, and that is the creation of what we call the common market, eliminating all barriers to trade in products, services, finance, and even people. If you're in Poland, you can work in the UK, famous Polish plumber issue. And it's almost as easy for a product to go from Greece to Germany, from France to Sweden, as it is from Georgia to South Carolina. Virtually no barriers. Common regulatory schemes through mutual recognition. Really remarkable, absolutely remarkable. In addition, another institution which is worth mentioning and being inspired by is a more recent institution, only from 1995, and that is the creation of a monetary union, now with 18 of the 28 countries, a European central bank like our Federal Reserve, and a currency, the euro. There are now 334 million Europeans who use the euro every day, and another 210 million people around the world, including, by the way, 182 million in Africa, who have pegged their currency not to the dollar, but to the euro. The euro is the second most circulated currency. It's the second reserve currency in the world next to the United States. And actually, if you add the coins and, and paper, it actually exceeds the U.S. dollar. I remember when I was ambassador from 93 to 96, and the European Union was just beginning to debate the creation of the euro, the monetary union. And I started to send cables back to Washington, to the Treasury Department of State, saying, you know, I think this may happen. And it was met with great derision in Washington. How can you possibly bring under one union economies so disparate 
as those in southern and northern Europe. And let me give you one anecdote, because this was a political decision, not just an economic decision. The anecdote is this. I went to see the French ambassador to the EU, de Boissier, who was a cousin to de Gaulle, and let you know he was. <laughs> and I said, Mr. Ambassador, are you really prepared to give up the French franc with all of its hundreds of years of history, Louis XIV on the paper on the front for a euro? Mr. Ambassador, you do not understand. I said, well, I don't. That's why I'm here. Please tell me. Do you know, Mr. Ambassador, that we have fought three wars with Germany? If there is a common currency in which we and Germany are locked together, countries can't go to war against their own currency. It will assure there will never be a war between Germany and France. Now, we'll talk more about the euro in a minute. But the birth of the euro was a dramatic political statement, a dramatic commitment to bind countries together that had been at each other's throats for so long. Now, that's the good news. Let's talk about some of the challenges what I would call wake-up calls that the EU has faced and is facing as we speak. The first wake-up call was the Euro crisis, 2009-2010, which threatened the very foundation of this Euro and seemed to validate those doubters at the Treasury Department and State some pretty smart guys and women, may I say, who said you can't bring these disparate economies together. Now, I want to make it very clear. Europe didn't start the Euro crisis. It started right here in River City in the United States. It was our profligacy, our bad mortgages rated AAA, our Lehman Brothers, But the impact of what we started <coughs> reverberated in a violent economic way in Europe and shook the very foundations of the Euro and the Monetary Union. And countries like Greece, Mr. M Mr. Council General, 27% unemployment, Spain, 50% youth unemployment, 5-0 youth unemployment. The currencies and the, the banks were under great threat, and the spreads for the bonds in Greece and those, for example, in Germany were dramatic. So a 10-year bond at the height of the crisis was a 30% interest rate, 3-0%. No country can afford that. The same thing happened in Spain and in Ireland. And it really shook the entire institution to its very core. Could it come? out of this, and it has. And it has because of a number of things. Haltingly, yes, but our response to our crisis was halting also because the financial crisis we experienced in 2008, 2009 was something no living person, or adult for sure, had known since the Great Depression. So the first thing is they created a 500 billion euro European stability mechanism 
to try to create some kind of a safety net under the countries most at risk. And only last year, okay, June of 2013, they agreed that 60 billion euros of that 500 billion could be used to help those banks in needy member states that were most at risk. Now, remember, these are pool resources. Pool resources. It's really quite remarkable. Now, yes, Germany, I wish, had acted faster and so forth, but this is also the German public which is paying for this. The second thing, after the 60 billion, was a very important statement. I would say a historic statement by the real hero, and that hero is Mario Draghi, the president of the European Central Bank in Frankfurt. The markets were going manic. They were driving bonds up to 30 percent, 25 percent in Ireland, punishing rates that no country could afford to ever pay back. And Draghi said, in a very simple term, I will do everything that it takes, quote unquote, to make sure that there are no sovereign defaults. And it was like puncturing a bubble. He has never had to spend one euro to back that statement up. Because his credibility and the European Central Bank's credibility is such that no one wanted to bet against it. And so now that 30% 10-year bond in Greece is 6%. And Greece has come back into the credit markets just within the last few weeks with a very well-received bond, and so has Spain, and so has Ireland. And so this incredible crisis is now at one level over. The euro is secure. And it's hard to imagine there will ever be a repeat of this kind of crisis. Now, having said that, having said that, it's important to recognize that there is another shoe on this foot. And that is, we took a very different approach in the United States to our great recession, to our financial crisis than Europe. We stimulated the Fed purchased hundreds of billions of dollars now just beginning to unwind. In fact, trillions of dollars of mortgage-backed securities and other bonds. We had a fiscal policy that was expansionary. Europe took exactly the opposite tact, austerity, belt tightening. And I don't want to go back and start talking about who was right and who was wrong. We took very different approaches. But everyone would now say, that with the euro saved, there have been real punishing implications for this austerity. Today, yesterday in Greece, in Athens, demonstrations. A tremendous amount of pain and suffering. And nationalists, even anti-Semitic parties like the Golden Dawn have have arisen because of the people's frustration. So it is critical now for the other shoe to drop. And by that I mean it's now time for a growth policy in Europe so that kids have a chance of getting a job. And it's especially important because the 
demographics in Europe are very different than here. We're a much younger society, and Lord knows we have our own entitlement problems, but they're more severe because their retirements are richer, they retire earlier, and they have fewer workers to support those retirees. So the forecast, which we actually had validated at our UPS board meeting today, is that in 2013, Europe grew at one-tenth of one percent, just above zero. The estimates for 2014 are one and a half percent, but that's half of what they'll be in the United States, where we expect three percent. And that's not enough to cut into this massive unemployment. So here are some suggestions. First, Europe needs thoroughgoing labor market reforms. State assets need to be sold. And it's critically important that the European Union and the U.S. complete the negotiations for a transatlantic trade and investment partnership agreement, which have now been negotiated for a number of months. As we call it, TTIP is a deficit free, inflation free stimulus for Europe and the United States. It will add a hundred billion dollars of GDP to both of our countries. One full percent in Europe, a half a percent here. It will create hundreds of thousands of new jobs. It is the most ambitious, and I've negotiated a lot of them, the most ambitious comprehensive trade agreement ever negotiated, far exceeding even those in the World Trade Organization with 150 or 200 countries. It covers everything. Tariffs on products, tariffs on agricultural goods, intellectual property, labor mobility, services, And we must make sure it is successful. We have so much riding on it. I don't want to take you, I'll be glad in the question period to go into details. But I want to make another point about TTIP. As important as it is as a growth engine for Europe and for us, there is to me an even more important, broader geopolitical reason why we have to succeed. And that is that it will bind the U.S. and Europe together indelibly. We are now 50 percent of total world GDP, Europe and U.S. We are a third of all global trade. But with the reset and focus on Asia, it's important that Europe know that the United States is not going to abandon the countries that share Western values. When we have to negotiate with Iran on the nuclear issue or on Syria or deal with Russia, we don't go to Thailand or Japan or China. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's important. These are new markets. We go to Europe because that's where we share common values and outlook. And so there is a geopolitical importance to this agreement. If we can deliver, it is a way of saying that the Chinese and Russian state-controlled models of capitalism, which they tout to the developing world as the new model for the 21st century, that no, it is our model, which is just as relevant in the 21st century as in the 20th free markets, free peoples, free intellectual property and protected intellectual property, free thought, innovation, tolerance. We've got to be able to show that this model works in the 21st century. And this is one of the tests for it. Now there is a second wake up call the first being this euro crisis, which again, Europe has 
met the first test for, but needs to take the second on growth. And that second wake-up call occurred with the breakup of the post-Cold War Yugoslavia in 1991-92, and then the wars in Bosnia in 92 to 95, when I was in the Clinton administration. Foreign Minister Jacques Pou of Luxembourg, which held the rotating presidency of the Council of Europe at the time, famously declared, this is the hour of Europe, not the hour of America. He was dead wrong. Europe was unable to muster the capability of intervening and in stopping this ethnic cleansing, and it took American-led military intervention in Bosnia and later in Kosovo to end this inglorious part of European late 20th century history. But out of tragedy can come positive development. Because the EU realized that it was unable to muster a common policy. And so, in the much debated, finally passed Lisbon Treaty, which went into effect at the end of 2009, just a few years ago, the European Union created a common foreign and security policy with a high representative, now Lady Catherine Ashton, who conducts foreign policy for the EU. Now, mind you, there still is and will always be a foreign minister from France and from the UK and so forth. But I do want to tell you that the degree of coordination, while it's not perfect, as a result of the Lisbon Treaty is impressive. And so it is the EU that is part of the so-called quartet on Middle East policy. It's Lady Ashton who is negotiating with Secretary Kerry and Wendy Sherman with Iran on nuclear power, the yeah, nuclear issue. This is a very, very meaningful thing. There are, in fact, 3,000 now new diplomats in a European external services in 130 countries around the world and some here. A real foreign service, like our career foreign service from the State Department. And you know, you, we all travel and we have a problem. We go to the U.S. Embassy or a consulate. And now there are 130 of these delegations from the European Commission. It's a remarkable thing. And that gets me to the third and last challenge, the third wake-up call. And it's one we have not woken up to. The alarm is still ringing and we're sleeping. And that's what's happening in the Ukraine and Russia. This is not something out of the blue, where Putin simply woke up on the wrong side of the bed one day. It is part and parcel of a well-conceived policy. So it started, for example, and Transnistria and Moldova, which is a Russian-speaking entity, which declared its independence and was recognized by Russia, only Russia. And then in 2008, while we all slept, Russia invaded Georgia, not this Georgia, the other Georgia. We would have put up a better fight here, I think. <laughs> and carved out two pro-Russian enclaves, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, with hundreds of Georgian soldiers killed, with the internal displacement of over 100,000 people. So I want you to please look at what's happened in Ukraine, 
not in isolation. It is part of President Putin's well thought through policy of exerting influence on his so-called near abroad or sometimes he calls the new Russia. Get a group of Russians in any one of these countries and it's important for him to protect them even if it means carving the country out. What's happened in Ukraine is a watershed. It's a watershed for the US. It's a watershed for the EU. It's a watershed for the West. Because it means that the whole post-World War II and post-Cold War construct is being threatened. As President Obama eloquently stated, if a large country can simply violate the territorial integrity of a smaller one, where are we in the 21st century? Now, Mind you, the Ukrainians were not blameless in this situation. They gave Putin the opportunity to do what he wanted because when the European Union was just about finished with its negotiations for a EU accession agreement, Putin began to say, wait a minute now, you know, Ukraine is on our border. Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. Now it's going to be leaning toward, if not a future member, of the European Union. But the opportunity was this. And that is there was when, when the pro-Russian president backed away under Putin's president, pressure from signing the final accord, there were riots in the street against this pro-Russian president, Yanukovych. And what then happened was that three EU foreign ministers, including the Polish foreign minister, negotiated on behalf of the EU what seemed to be a solution to the problem, which the Russians would have acquiesced in, which was to keep Yanukovych in office until December, earlier than his term would normally end, and to have early elections. And when the demonstrations then threw him out, the new interim government in Kiev, the Ukrainian government, as one of its first acts was to seemingly take away the language, the Russian language rights of Russian ethnic Ukrainians in the East. Just exactly what Putin needed. And so he took the Crimea, annexed it, and now made it a part of Mother Russia. And it was a pretty good day's work for him because the costs were very minimal. We put some of the usual suspects on a visa ban and asset freeze. And he could say, you know, boy, if this is all there is, how about the rest of eastern Ukraine? And so now there is an effort to destabilize major cities like Donetsk and others in eastern Ukraine by a group of pro-Russian thugs, so-called green men, who don't have any markings on their Russian outfits. Somehow that's supposed to mask who they are. And they've taken over government buildings and police stations. And the Ukrainian military is so disabled, so corrupted, that they're not able to take those places back. This also violates directly the 1994 Budapest Memorandum signed by Russia saying that Ukraine's 
territorial integrity will be maintained. And yet with all of this, the EU sanctions are even less strong than those we have had, which at least have targeted a few Russian banks and some of the major oligarchs around Putin, including the bank in which Putin does his banking. You and I should have a bank account that size, by the way. Why has the EU not taken firmer action? They've got a common foreign and security policy. They've got a high representative who sits with secretaries of state. They were willing to their great credit, and it is to their great credit, to really join with us in applying tough sanctions on Iran. That's why Iran is at the bargaining table, I can assure you. What did the EU do? They agreed with us to expel all private Iranian banks from the Brussels-based SWIFT system, which clears all dollar-denominated transactions. They targeted the Central Bank of Iran. And even more remarkable, much more self-sacrificial on the EU's part, they decided that they would accept no Iranian oil imports. That was 18% of their total oil imports. We got zero from Iran. This was remarkable, but they're not doing it now. Why? Because their trade relationship and commercial relationship with Russia dwarfs ours. Ours is like $50 billion a year, which is peanuts. I'm saying the wrong thing in, uh, with President Carter, but it's peanuts. Uh, it's like six times that amount, seven times that amount for Europe. And because Germany gets a third of its natural gas from Russia, and other European countries likewise depend on it, like Slovakia. And so they are tied in knots. What did we see just within the last week at the height of this crisis? The CEO of Siemens goes to Moscow and meets with President Putin to assure him that nothing will interfere with their business relationships with Russia. Now, I want to suggest and close by specific prescriptions. And I want to do so in this context. Russia does not hold all the economic cards. It is true, it is true that Europe heavily depends on Russian energy. It's also true that Russia has to have customers for that energy. 50% of their total revenues for their government come from their energy sales. They've had, even before the full sanctions bit, in the first quarter of this year, $50 billion of capital flight, a 10% drop in their stock market. Foreign direct investment basically stopping. If we can show the determination to apply meaningful sanctions, it can have a real impact. So here are my suggestions. First, and now, don't make the red line for meaningful sanctions tanks coming in from those 40,000 troops that Russia has amassed, because that won't happen. Why should it happen? Putin doesn't need it to happen. He's already destabilizing Eastern Europe without doing it. The red line should be, if he causes such destabilization as to make the May 25th presidential elections in Ukraine impossible to freely carry out because people, particularly in the south and east of Ukraine, are intimidated from voting. And that's what he wants to do. So there's no legitimate government elected on May 25th. And we have to be very clear now 
that that type of action will occasion the same kind of tough sectoral sanctions on their financial institutions, on their mining industry, and on their energy industry as would a direct invasion. And there was a good start on that just a few days ago when Chancellor Merkel, to her credit, and President Obama in Washington pledged that if these elections are destabilized by Russia, that it will occasion much stronger and firmer sanctions. And it is critical that this not just be rhetoric, not like the red line in Syria. We've got one chance to show Western will. And if we blow it, we will pay a horrible price into your children and grandchildren's time. Second, the EU should announce now that it is going to start on a long-term and medium-term European energy policy that will reduce its dependence on Russian natural gas because of the geopolitical risks involved. Even stating that will have an important impact. And that energy policy should involve the following. The development of pipelines connecting the 28 countries of the EU which do not go through Russia. U.S. support for the Southern Route Pipeline that will take gas and oil out of the Caspian Sea to the EU without traveling through Russia. The beginning of development of plentiful shale gas and oil resources in Europe, in France, Germany, and Poland, which they will not start at all of environmental objections. Now, if this Ukrainian situation had occurred five years from now, certainly 10 years from now, it would be a very different situation. Because we will be within three years, indeed, perhaps within 18 months, we, the United States of America, the number one natural gas producer in the world. And in less than 10, because of this fracking technology we've developed, we will be the number one crude oil producer, more than Saudi Arabia and more than Russia. There's a terminal being built right now in Louisiana. And when it's completed in 2017, it can supply one terminal alone one-sixth of the natural gas for Europe. And there are 25 terminals waiting for licenses. And the president has said that if we can pass TTIP, it will expedite those. We've got to get the bureaucracy to make those licenses pass, because if we can build those terminals, it will make us a mammoth natural gas producer. You can't. There are only two ways to export natural gas, through a pipeline and through liquefying it. And to serve Europe, we've got to liquefy it. And we can liquefy it if we do this. So we've got to get those passed, and that's our part. We've also got to encourage Germany to rethink its shutting off of its nuclear power. What that's done is made it more dependent on Russian gas and on dirty coal. And last, the West has got to get together and make Ukraine a success story by marshalling our billion dollars that Congress has appropriated money from the European Union, which it's willing to do, and from the IMF, so that we can sh make sure it works. Two other thoughts, and then I'll close. And that is the European members of NATO have consistently refused to honor their pledge 
to spend at least 2% of their GDP on defense. We're at 4%. The average in the EU is 1.5%. If they make that decision and we invigorate NATO and we have more forward placement of troops on the front lines, like in Poland, like in the Visegrad countries, Hungary and the Czech Republic, if we could, there's not one U.S. carrier in the Mediterranean or in the Baltic. Those need to be deployed. We've got to show a determination. And the best way to avoid a military confrontation is to do it through tough sanctions and through building up NATO. So I want to close with this thought on Europe Day. The EU has come so far. It's a truly remarkable success story. And now to really undergird the dream of Jean Monnet and of Robert Schumann and of the other founding fathers, it is now to meet this new 21st century national security threat by working together with the U.S. and demonstrating that the very basis upon which the EU was founded, the very construct, we will not permit any country on the European continent to wreck. That will be a real Europe day. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have very little time after that semester of hugely thoughtful and very important uh, message that you've given us uh, and our stars. Well, let me staff. take a few questions before I go. So let me yes. start with the following story that was told to me when I was uh, President Carter's chief domestic advisor by Russell Long, who was then the very colorful senator from Louisiana and the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee through which a lot of our domestic legislation went. And Russell told the following story about Papa, his even more colorful father, Huey Long, the kingfish, who was governor of Louisiana in the late 20s and early 30s. So Russell said that Papa came home to the governor's mansion in Baton Rouge one night, just stone cold drunk and with a very shaky hand finally got the key in the keyhole to a line, and Russell on the other side of the door holding on to Mama's apron string seems Papa just collapsed in the foyer. And Russell said Mama, with her hands closed, looks down sternly for an explanation as to how this state of affairs could have occurred to the governor of the great state of Louisiana. And Russell said that Papa, without pause, said, Mama, I've completed my prepared remarks. I'll now take questions from the floor. <laughs> So, they've only given me water here, but I was right. Well, we will take one, uh, Mark uh, Pearson. Yes. Is this on? Okay. We'll actually take two, and only those two. Okay. So make it quick. Okay. Yes. Um, I don't know if you saw the cover of The Economist magazine this week, but the cover story was, What Would America Fight For? And it's talking about how out the allies of the United States around the world are nervous because you know we're still seen as the superpower who will go in, make the threats, need to have the backup. In Ukraine, your point about the gas is is similar. So the well, you've had your time. situation we're still seen as the superpower. What are your thoughts? As are we still supposed to be the ones going in negotiating with the Ukraine? Yes, I mean, we clearly are the leaders, but we can't do it alone. And if, if we, this is one of the problems, are we willing, we have been willing to go further on sanctions in the EU. To make these meaningful, the EU and the U.S., as they have with Iran, have to be cheek to jaw. We have to come in together. Now, we also have to be realistic. We don't have a direct military option in Ukraine. We can't drop, you know, the 82nd Airborne into Kiev. But we don't have to if we can show a determination. 
And if you look at the front page of the Financial Times or the New York Times today or some of the other papers, you'll see Putin beginning to back away. I think, I hope, because of the Merkel-Obama pledge. But we've got to follow through on this. And he's got to know that if he destabilizes U Ukraine and these elections are a farce, that we're willing to make sure that Russian banks can't do any dollar-denominated business. Because the Ukraine is so important, we'll take one more question. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Oksana Klimovich, and I'm originally from Ukraine. I'm visiting scholar here at Emory University. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for all these messages you sent. And actually, my question was about hope, whether there is a hope for Ukraine. And you mentioned hope at least three times in your speech. So my question is still, do you believe there is a hope for uh, yes, there, there is democratic elections? There is a hope, elections. but I want to say this, okay? I'm going to say it very clearly. We can't make Ukraine a whole country. Ukraine ranks 144th on the Transparency International list among the most corrupt countries. Unless a new government willing to take on corruption, willing to earn the trust of its people, will come into power, then no amount of effort by the EU and the US can succeed. We can't make Ukraine a whole country. We can, we can do a lot, but the Ukrainians themselves have got to take things into their horns. And I think that's what these demonstrations were about. It was a demonstration against corruption. So you have your part to play also. Do you see any Thank change within much. the last three months? Yeah. This is a question. Do you see the change in Ukraine? Because I, last time I was in Ukraine was in December. So this is my question. I, I do. I think there's a willingness. I think the people have, are fed up. Look, if you took a poll in eastern Ukraine, okay, eastern Ukraine, and there have been polls taken, NDI, the National Democrat Institute, the International Republican Institute, roughly 70 to 75 percent of the people in eastern Ukraine want to remain Ukrainian. This is not a repeat of Crimea. The Crimeans... I mean, Crimea was by an accident of history given by Khrushchev to the Ukraine because at that time they were all part of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. He was from Ukraine. He thought it was a nice thing to do for his own country, not realizing that the Soviet Union would break up. So eastern Ukraine is a very, very different situation. And we've got to give the people of eastern Ukraine, as obviously in western Ukraine, the opportunity to vote their conscience and that's what Putin is trying to disrupt, and we can't allow it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before concluding, I'd like to express the deep gratitude of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta to Ambassador Eisenstadt for his support and encouragement of the Council's activities. As he mentioned, this is the third time in four years that he's been the keynote speaker and presenter at a Council program, which is quite exceptional. In fact, the only one who's done that and honored us in that way. And at one of those events at the beginning, he urged the Council to be brazen and disruptive in its approach to programming. And it's a tagline that our President, Wayne Lord, has been using ever since and has been an inspiration for us. The World Affairs Council would also like to recognize the critical and sustained contribution Ambassador Eisenstadt has made to EU-US relations for over 30 years in the diplomatic and economic spheres, and most especially in connection with restitution for the victims of the Holocaust and other Holocaust-era issues. I'd like to ask our Chairman David Abney to step forward and to present a small token of our appreciation. Thank you. 
So on the occasion of Europe Day 2014, presented to the Honorable Stuart E. Eisenstadt by the World Affairs Council of Atlanta in recognition of his lifetime contributions to EU-US relations on May the 8th, 2014. Thank you. <laughs> I thought maybe it would be muscles from Brussels for that. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you please to remain seated while the ambassador leaves because his car is waiting, as is his flight to his 50th uh, reunion. Thank you very much, dear.